please welcome Josh Nelson. Hey everybody, how are you? Thanks for being here. Oh, very cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. Welcome to the Central Library. Uh, we're happy to be here while the band takes the stage. Let me just tell you a little bit about Discovery Project. This is an ongoing multimedia uh, event, if you will, um, where storytelling and music and um, uh, visuals all come together. A lot of stories that we're going to share with you tonight uh, and some new music, hopefully, uh, you enjoy yourselves. Uh, it's, we're just doing one long show, and uh, yeah, I'd like to welcome to the stage an inspiration behind this as well. I was driving on Forest Lawn um, right by uh, the cemetery over there, and I heard this story come on about Griffith, Griffiths, and that was the seed that started this whole version of the show. And it was this gentleman's podcast that kind of got me going, thinking about I should put together something about Los Angeles. So please welcome from the Hidden History of Los Angeles podcast, Mr. Robert Peterson. Many people think Los Angeles doesn't have any history or any real history. They think LA is a vapid compilation of strip malls, fast food joints, and parking lots with a 15 minute memory. But if you take the time to look beneath the surface, you will find a rich and fascinating history of a city like no other. But often this history is hard to see because the physical structures have vanished. Too often we tear down and forget to make way for a reimagined tomorrow. But the sky remains the same. Tonight's first piece is Bridges and Tunnels.
Griffith Park is so named because the land was gifted to the city by a man known as Colonel Griffith J. Griffith. But few know the lurid tale behind the man and his generous act. A closeted alcoholic who would drink as much as half a gallon of whiskey every day. Griffith grew paranoid of his wife, Tina. He suspected her of conspiring with the Pope to poison him. <laughs> Then one evening, it came to a head. In a drunken rage, Griffith held a gun to Tina's head and demanded that she kneel before him and swear on the Bible. As Tina proclaimed her innocence, Griffith pulled the trigger and shot her in the face. Bleeding and blinded, Tina jumped out a nearby window and luckily survived. In a court case that shocked the city, Griffith was found guilty of attempted murder, but only served two years in prison. Hoping to repair his public image, Griffith donated the money to build the Greek Theater and Griffith Observatory. It is curious that out of such a heinous and violent act came two of our most beloved LA institutions. This is The Sky Remains. Over there, watch the water. It's a river I played in as a girl. You can see far all the way to the ocean. High upon this hill. But at night, my colonel brings me the stars from here we count the constellations mercury and mars what is remembered how do we forget when men change history in the smoke of a cigarette what is a story a picture in a City's different now, but the sky remains the same. Mercury and Mars 
Los Angeles was home to a fearless, but often forgotten, African-American journalist and civil rights activist named Charlotta Bass. Bass owned and edited LA's oldest black newspaper, the California Eagle. And from the 19-teens through the 1950s, she used the newspaper as a platform to fight for a variety of civil rights issues. But being a firebrand put her in danger. One night when she was working alone in the office, some KKK members showed up demanding to be let in. Bass didn't run or hide. Instead, she pulled out her gun and went to the window to let the Klan members know that she would not be intimidated. And the Klan members retreated into the night. This next piece by Josh Johnson shares the title of Bass's weekly, weekly column, On the Sidewalk.
The Los Angeles Central Library is a monument to fine architecture and artwork. The original building's architect, Bertram Goodhue, sought to inspire Angelinos to better themselves. When designing the building, he urged his colleagues to, quote, make people scratch their heads. Not scratch their heads and give it up, but to find out what it's all about. To that end, he designed a building that is an exotic blend of Spanish, Egyptian, Byzantine, and Islamic influences. A central tower topped with a tiled mosaic pyramid. There are sphinxes, snakes, celestial mosaics, allusions to Moses, Muhammad, and Buddha. It is the vision of an architect at his peak, unconfined by expectation. And today, 90 years later, after the library first opened its doors, the building continues to inspire. And now the building sits amidst a downtown littered with stunning architecture, from Union Station to the Bradbury Building, from the Broad to Disney Hall. It is the architects, like the Discovery Project's own Jesse, Jesse Ottinger, whose vision has created the wonderful landscape of this city. This next song is titled, The Architect.
Thank you. How about for Danny Janklo? Danny Janklo on the alto. Alex on bass and Dan on drums. Just want to lead, read a, a little short excerpt from the book that this next piece is based on. Um, in doing research about Los Angeles and its history, I came across a great book, and uh, I'm sure it's in the library here, and maybe some of you have read it, Ask the Dust by John Fonte. And uh, from the late 30s, uh, just a fantastic, interesting, dark, sarcastic, witty, <laughs> Interesting look at a writer trying to make it in 1930s Los Angeles, and um, I highly recommend it. It's an it's a interesting read. Uh, and here's an excerpt from that. All that was good in me thrilled in my heart at that moment. All that I ho hoped for in the profound, obscure meaning of my existence. Here was the endlessly mute placidity of nature indifferent to the great city. Here was the desert beneath these streets, around these streets, waiting for the city to die, to cover it with timeless sand once more. There came over me a terrifying sense of understanding about the meaning and the pathetic destiny of men. The desert was always there, a patient white animal waiting for men to die, for civilizations to flicker and pass into the darkness. Then men seemed brave to me, and I was proud to be numbered among them. All the evil of the world seemed not evil at all, but inevitable and good, and part of that endless struggle to keep the desert down.
must cling to you Los Angeles Show me how to feel your sunshine Kathleen Grace. Kathleen doesn't usually sing this song in the show. Uh, uh, Dan Schnell, the drummer, his wife Lillian Singpale is usually a part of this, and she couldn't be here today, so that was a little tribute to Lillian and her contribution. Yeah. It's Kathleen, wonderful job. Today, Arcadia is an affluent and quiet suburb located just east of Pasadena known mostly for its excellent public schools and incredible Taiwanese dumplings from Den Taifung. <laughs> but don't let its reputation fool you. The city has some fascinating stories to tell, like Arcadia's founder, Lucky Baldwin, who created Arcadia not to be a quiet suburb, but rather an American Monte Carlo, filled with horse racing, slot machines, poker games, and lots of saloons. In fact, in the early days of Arcadia, saloons outnumbered the number of schools, churches, and general stores combined. <laughs> Arcadia is also home to possibly the largest case of fine wine fraud in history. Rudy Kernawan came to prominence in the early 2000s as a wine connoisseur, and he became known for having arguably the greatest seller on earth. But in reality, he was buying large quantities of cheaper wine and relabeling them as rare and expensive wines, and in the process making millions of dollars. 
He was finally arrested by the FBI at his home in Arcadia in 2012 and is currently serving a 10-year prison sentence. <laughs> Sometimes the label does not match the contents. Written by our very own Anthony Wilson, this piece is titled Arcadia. It's a simple house Just a couple minutes south Of the foothills Near the track of The workshop in the back Where I can concentrate On the things I make Near the racetrack in my workshop out back When I started then It was easy to pretend It came naturally Like another better me The perfect script just flowing from his lips It was so easy then It was almost not pretend Arcadia, let's watch the horses run We'll climb the mountainside Beneath the sun And turn the lazy Susan Till we've all had some And stumble out Arcadia one by one But for some time now It's no use to wondering how They fixed their sights on me I was working carelessly And attracting doubt With the product I sent out I gave up on wondering how they found me now Arcadia, let's watch the horses run We'll climb the mountainside beneath the sun and turn the lazy Susan Till we've all had some And stumble out Arcadia one by one They've come for me I'll go quietly They're gathered round my door And I can't hide anymore In the light of day With no place to run away Now they've come for me Go quietly
Do 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 da da do do da da da. While the history of tiki culture dates back to ancient Polynesia, tiki restaurants and bars actually trace their origin to 1930s Los Angeles. To create the ultimate escapist experience for their customers, proprietors of tropical restaurants use theatrical effects, not unlike those being employed on Hollywood movie sets, to create an imagined Polynesian paradise. The next piece is Lost Souls of Saturn. By veteran Los Angeles movie, TV, and big band composer Russ Garcia. Russ was a fixture in Hollywood for many years, scoring movies like The Time Machine, among many others.
for Kathleen on those screams. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, it was Lillian's part, but she stepped up and learned that as well. So some nice high Cs. <laughs> and um, that's from a record uh, called Fantastica, 1959. It's actually the year before Russ Garcia scored Time Machine. He tried out all these cool little Polynesian 
loungy <laughs> tricks on this record. If you can find it, Fantastica. It's a really fun record. Um, that's called Lost Souls of Saturn. Yeah. And uh, we're going to continue now with a, a, a short version of a, a famous uh, record, a uh, record, famous, uh, well, it is a record too, but famous film from 1974. Of course, apropos to do at uh, a great institution like the library, um, the story of Chinatown, uh, Roman Polanski's Chinatown 1974 with uh, Jack Nicholson, Faye Dunaway, John Huston, so many others, and uh, a wonderful score by Jerry Goldsmith. And um, I just love this movie so much and I uh, love the music. So we're going to feature Chris Lawrence on the theme from Chinatown by Jerry Goldsmith. Thank you.
Florence. Did you know that one of the most significant fires in Los Angeles history started just a few steps from where you are currently sitting? On April 29, 1986, the Los Angeles Central Library fell victim to arson. The fire burned for seven hours and reached temperatures of 2,500 degrees, while over 250 firefighters battled the blaze. In the end, over a million books were damaged. It remains the largest library fire ever in the United States. Thankfully, Angelinos responded to the tragedy as over a thousand volunteers rushed to save damaged books and millions of dollars were raised so the library could rise like a phoenix from the ashes. In 1993, a restored and renovated library opened, which included the addition of the new East Wing in which we are currently sitting.
and we will continue to experience devastating wildfires, especially if we build deeper into the canyons and foothills. The reality is that fire is common here. In fact, it is part of our ecology going back centuries. And climate change has only increased the danger. In the making of this city, Angelinos have overcome many natural impediments. But these wildfires remind us that Mother Nature cannot be tamed. At the same time, our response to fire at times can reveal the best of the human spirit. Gentlemen, Kathleen Grace. <laughs> By the way, Kathleen has a, a beautiful record out, um, No Place to Fall, and uh, uh, Anthony has some records out. I do, so if you're interested, please find us after, and we can maybe hook you up with that little shameless plug there. Everyone doing okay? We're we're nearing the home stretch here. Yeah, good. Got a few more. Back to Robert. For generations, Los Angeles has been a magnet for aspiring musicians, actors, and other artists. While some do make their dreams come true, many don't. And for some, success is not what they expected. There is a quote often attributed, maybe falsely, to the LA writer Charles Bukowski. Find what you love and let it kill you. <laughs> let it drain you of your all. Let it cling onto your back and weigh you down into eventual nothingness. Let it kill you. Let it devour your remains. For all things will kill you, both slowly and fastly. But it's much better to be killed by a lover. Like Bukowski, there is a darkness in the work of the composer of our next piece, singer-songwriter Elliot Smith, who took his own life at the age of 34. Interestingly, Smith once said of the writer, I don't care too much for Bukowski. He seems too, like, too much like he's telling me stuff I already know. This next piece is titled Pitsula.
first time I saw you I knew it would never last I'm not half of what I wish I was I'm so angry I don't think it'll ever pass I was bad news for you Just because I never meant to hurt Before Angelinos pledged their undying love to cars, we were a city connected by streetcars, funiculars, horses, and trains. And how did people get from their houses in the hills to transit lines? Stairs, lots and lots of stairs. Hundreds of historic stairways wind through LA's steep hillside neighborhoods. This next piece is titled, Stairways.
Pacific Ocean Park was a 28-acre amusement park located on a pier in Santa Monica. It opened in 1958 and was supposed to compete with Disneyland. But after years of neglect and mismanagement, POP, as it was called, fell into disrepair and closed in 1967. But the ruins of the pier became an important piece of early Southern California skateboarding history as a favorite hangout for the famous Z-Boys skateboarding team, which included the likes of Tony Alva and Stacy Peralta, who later described it this way. When the pier closed down, it became a mysterious looking place. It was a forbidden place, a place that looked like a good dream that had turned bad. This is P.O.P. And a little note about P.O.P. Uh, I never got to go there as a kid, but my dad uh, did, and he uh, ended up working for Walt Disney as an Imagineer for many years, and so uh, growing up in a Disney household was pretty cool. And then uh, you're gonna hear a uh, clip from the merry-go-round at Griffith Park to bring it all full circle, apparently the same merry-go-round that Walt Disney got the idea to do Disneyland with. So this is a little clip of the song that I heard playing that day and we turned it into an arrangement. So hope you enjoy, P.O.P.
Brian Wallace. Brian Wallace on the clarinet. Here we have the Robinson Memorial statue across the street from Pasadena City Hall. But who was Mac Robinson? The name probably doesn't ring a bell, but it should. Here he is racing in the 200 meter dash at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. He came in second, winning the silver medal, finishing less than a half a second behind Jesse Owens. While Jesse Owens became a household name, Mac returned to Pasadena and got a job sweeping the streets and gutters. Ten years later, his younger brother, Jackie, broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball with the Brooklyn Dodgers, forever transforming the great America pastime. Living in the shadows of two sports legends, Mac Robinson stayed in his hometown of Pasadena and in the face of discrimination, worked tirelessly to make the city a better place by becoming an activist against blight and crime. This piece is titled, Run. Broken shoes lay step tight wide lines in the heat silver charm hanging heavy in the sun a broom kicking dust down the street all for you the crowd and it's cries eyes fixed body low kissing the moment
And alone. 